since uh, we have this ability, I, sh I share the screen. I go here and uh, okay. And now uh, <laughs> there is something here that uh, refuses to move away. Come on, slideshow from beginning. Okay, Giacomo Barozzi da Vignola. I think, I, I don't know, but I do think the name of someone says something about uh, that person. And I, I don't know that Barozzi is a little bit, I, I, th I have a feeling I am joking now, but not totally. If he was Giacomo da Vignola, sounds very convincing, but that Barozzi is a little bit, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's what uh, irritated Le Corbusier. I doubt it. But he's known as Vignola without, uh, sometimes Giacomo appears too, but never. Although, no, I also saw his name without Vignola, just Giacomo Barozzi. Um, anyway. So he lived for 60, uh, 66 years, 65, 66 years, uh, and uh, died 447 years ago. A nice engraving of him. He does look like a serious man. I, I really don't know why, um, why Le Corbusier was so much against him. It appears his coat was, uh, you know, it is said that uh, uh, the coats uh, for men are, uh, you know, I don't know how to say, they overlap on the right and the, for women on the left. This, if the engraving is not in the mirror, uh, seems to <laughs> show that his coat was, um, you know, uh, using the feminine uh, fashion. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But he's considered, uh, together with Serlio and uh, Palladio, uh, as the architect who spread the Renaissance uh, all over Europe, although kind of late, because uh, it was already mid-16th uh, century. So he was born in 1507. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the, the histories of art claim that uh, mannerism started about 1520, and, um, you know, it went on until the end of the 16th century and in Northern Europe, even in the 17th century. Anyway, <laughs> as I said, uh, the poor Vignola irritated, um, irritated uh, Le Corbusier beyond measure. So he was one of the great Italian architects of 16th century mannerism. His two great masterpieces are the Villa Farnese at Caprarola and the Jesuits Church of the, of the Gesù, uh, I mean, Jesus, I imagine in Rome. The three architects who spread the Italian Renaissance style throughout Western Europe are Vignola, Serlio, and Palladio. Um, Serlio, more like a, an urbanism, so to speak. Okay, some drawings by him. Um, you know, they have been reproduced countless times because he was, and this, maybe this is what irritated Le Corbusier, that he tried to bring some order in the education of architecture uh, by, uh, you know, uh, systematizing uh, the knowledge prior to him by, by uh, drawing all these orders. But, but this is something Le Corbusier himself did in his own way with a modular and with all the, uh, you know, the five precepts uh, uh, that he exposed at the Siam meetings. So I, I actually think he had something in common with, with uh, Bignola. And this is what the great psychoanalyst uh, Carl Jung said, that when we criticize vehemently something outside of ourselves, that's because there is something within ourselves that recognizes itself or himself or herself in, 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 in the object of our criticism. And I believe there is some uh, valid reverse psychology in this. And I know it happened with me too, when I, when I was very, you know, uh, dramatically against something, later on I discovered that there was something within me that, that got irritated by what I was criticizing. Okay, here you have the five uh, orders, you know, and uh, I, I guess it is very possible 
that Vignola was struggling with certain uh, uh, insecurities, just as Le Corbusier did, and he tried to to handle them through these uh, systematic uh, uh, analyses of, of past architecture, which I believe this was the case with Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier had a very dark side, which maybe sooner or later a book should be published about this, if it wasn't already published. It's hard for me to believe that it wasn't already, but I don't know of. Le Corbusier had a very dark uh, side, which was reflected in uh, some uh, erotical drawings by him, but also his letters to his mother. And uh, uh, he had a complicated uh, uh, psychology. And maybe that's why he needed, uh, you know, reason. He needed systems. And he betrayed the system later on, but he needed at first the system. Otherwise, he probably would have been disintegrated into uh, uh, unrepairable uh, fragments. Okay, so we see some drawings. You know, it is said that, that the Vignola system of, of transmitting knowledge is very clear, is very, uh, uh, you know, ordered and systematic. So, Vignola, Vignola was used in the schools of architecture uh, for, for centuries. And uh, I guess it was successful <laughs> until, uh, until Le Corbusier arrived. And uh, I don't know if you received my message. There is that page from the uh, Le Poème de Longue Le Droit where Le Corbusier, in a strange uh, exuberance uh, with a negative sign, uh, talks uh, actually uh, in, a, in a frivolous way uh, about and towards uh, Vignola. Anyway, yeah, maybe, maybe he was irritated by the fact that, that Vignola uh, established this um, or, or, or uh, exemplified past architecture through very systematic, uh, you know, diagrams and the very logical explanations and so on. And uh, maybe he was irritated by this because he was doing himself the same thing at, at his personal level through the modular and all his uh, inventions in the field of um, using numbers to control something that in a way was beyond numbers. Well, that's how education was transmitted through these prints, through these drawings, because uh, when Vignola was alive, uh, uh, the connection with the past was still uh, uh, respected and uh, there wasn't really a, a rebellious avant-garde, the kind we have or had in the 20th, 20th century. So there was still some continuity and some relevance and some respect for, uh, for uh, um, preceding forms of, of, of architecture. Actually, the more I look at these prints, the more I feel like studying them myself because I'm ignorant. I don't know. I mean, I saw pictures of these, but I never really studied them. Maybe, maybe uh, 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 less freedom would be some kind of a, um, impetus for architecture. Or to use the title of a book that I recommend to you, The Power of Limits. There is such a book written by a Hungarian architect, uh, full of drawings. And um, yeah, it, it, that book uh, explains why very successful, very important architectures of the past were actually dealing not with a limitless uh, prospect for architecture, but with the power of limits. It, it was within limits that they achieve great freedom. And yes, that's what we see here, uh, limits in a way, but, uh, you know, uh, people struggle for centuries to arrive at that, 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 those codifications. Now, uh, we start with the first building, Villa Giulia for Pope Julius III. Here, Vignola was working with Amanati, another important architect who designed the Nymphaeum and other garden features under the general direction of Vasari, 
with guidance from the knowledgeable Pope and Michelangelo. A medal of 1553 shows Michelangelo's main villa substantially as it was completed, save for a pair of couples, of cupolas. Um, uh, maybe, you know, I mean, it was a very large uh, villa. This is a model. Uh, maybe the manneries have to do, if, if we are to discern something manneristic here, uh, in, uh, in uh, this, uh, you know, in the curved parts, uh, and, uh, which are open, they are not enclosed, it's not a, uh, yeah, you could say even Bernini with his colonnade, you know, but Bernini was a Baroque already, uh, so past ma Manneries. As you know, Manneries followed uh, Renaissance and then Manneries was replaced, but of course the, there are no strong divisions between these currents, so to speak. Uh, you know, traditionally, traditionally mannerism is, is thought of being some kind of a transition between Renaissance and Baroque. Uh, sorry, some, some pictures do, are not very large and I couldn't find and this one I did find, but this salami distanced me with the insistence on the <laughs> authorship, which is a little bit uh, annoying. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so the, the level of distortions that mannerism uh, implicitly uh, promoted was still low if we compare with the um, uh, contemporary distortions. And I'm going to talk about distortions and instability today in the second presentation. Now, of course, there are lovely things here, you know. I mean, if you look at just this um, so-called detail, you know, uh, and again, the, the presence of sculptures uh, of statues of, uh, they, they, you know, it's always enriching and we don't have something like this today. We, we totally deprived architecture from a dialogue with sculpture and, and, and painting. And we could, sometimes we use so-called media arts, but uh, still kind of timidly and almost like an afterthought. If you take away the sculptures, you know, the, the, the building is impoverished. And this is also the case with Palladio. Remove the sculptures and you'll get a different result. So architecture by itself, Gropius was right. The arts should come together for the building, uh, which is the, the goal of, of, of all the arts coming together. Now, Villa Farnese at Caprarola, which is a famous work by him. Uh, you saw at the beginning that there are two major works by him. This is one of them. Uh, I have more pictures here, but not all of them I have the, the desired resolution. It's an ample villa and it's uh, almost like a fortress because of this its configuration, you know, its crystallization into an enclosed uh, building that has a courtyard, but that courtyard is uh, uh, protected uh, with uh, almost with vehemence. You see the, the plan itself, this is the, the plan of a fortress, of a mini fortress, or maybe not so mini. So this is Villa Farnese at Caprarola, um, where he also didn't work alone. I mean, at that time, <clears throat> there was collaboration. So collaboration was, is not today something uh, that it never happened before. No, it, it did happen. Sometimes you had several, uh, you know, uh, very acknowledged architects working together and uh, in the Middle Ages, of course, the, many people worked together and it didn't almost matter if they were famous or not famous. The so-called concept of fame didn't quite exist in the Middle Ages. 
I keep saying it, I saw an exhibition of Tadao Ando, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, where he signed a little sketch about 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters on a big wall, and it was his retrospective. So people knew it was by him because that's what it was. It was the exhibition Tadao Ando. So he signed that, that sketch twice in the lower left corner of the wall and in the uh, lower right corner of the wall. And I asked myself, why did he sign it? It was completely unnecessary. Plus, why sign it twice? And uh, Ando is not a frivolous architect at all. But, but this is the time we live in. We sign everything, you know, while Chartres Cathedral is not signed. I mean, it, it didn't even cross their minds, the great builders of that great cathedral to sign it. And it was a cathedral, not a sketch 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters that done with a pen on a white wall. But you see what a difference in the mentality of the, the artists and the, and the builders, the architects. Now we sign everything, you know. In fact, the signature becomes more important than the work. And uh, Kopp Himmelblau, they had an exhibition in New York many years ago, a storefront for after architecture. I didn't see that exhibition, but I was told that they were displaying only their signatures. They were all framed. So there were many, uh, you know, so-called artworks representing ju just their signatures. Kind of cynical, no? But also a sarcastic comment on today's culture. Anyway. We go back to, there are here a lot of complexities. This stair is famous and we, we, we are going to see uh, other pictures with it. Uh, and it, it is a complex building, but that, that courtyard is indeed uh, protected uh, uh, with uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, determination by, by the enclosure. Yeah, this is the, and now maybe, maybe mannerism is shown in the, in the spiral. The spiral is indeed kind of a mannerist, uh, uh, you know, form, as opposed to the circle, which belongs more to classicism. The, the circle is stable. The spiral is unstable, is dynamic, and it actually doesn't have a beginning and an end, theoretically. And, you know, if you look for the definition of the word mannerism, it, uh, it contains references to instability and deformation. So I actually think we live in, at a time of some kind of, uh, I mean, the mentality of today's architecture or architects, often, not always, but often it, it is, um, uh, externalized through, through no, it, it, it manifests signs of instability and uh, a certain uh, um, attraction towards uh, deformation. And of course, deconstruction comes immediately to mind. But it's not just deconstruction. Well, uh, Vignola also built a church, and you are going to see it in Rome where he used the oval, the, the ellipse, and that was some kind of a, 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 a announcing uh, the Baroque age, which also used often, uh, and, and that was almost natural to happen because you move away from the stability and centrality of the, of the circle, you move towards the ellipse, which has two, two, two centers already uh, a destabilizing uh, geometrical figure. As, as the spiral is as well. Otherwise, the building, you know, doesn't have towards the outside, to me, to my eye, um, obvious signs of mannerism at all. Inside, though, uh, it's a different story. But maybe mannerism also could be more subtle, you know, uh, you don't need to have extravagant or uh, eccentric uh, deformations. It could be subtle. 
Now, uh, villa, actually, there are two villas, uh, Banaya, Banyaya, uh, uh, including the gardens and the water features. And uh, here the gardens are magnificent, but there are actually two identical houses uh, in, in, in proximity, in close proximity, and they are, uh, uh, you know, it's almost uh, like the twin, uh, twin buildings. You kind of see them. We, I, I have another plan. You'll see the two houses. Uh, even here, you, you you have an idea where they are um, with darker shading. But what I like about you see them here: the left house and the right house, and they are identical. What is uh, beautiful actually here is not not so much the buildings. I, I mean, the, the buildings are you know as they are, but the gardens. And it's almost as, although the buildings do have uh, a geometrical, uh, uh, you know, uh, conviction or some kind of force, but but uh, the, the gardens uh, dispute the uh, predominance, and and uh, without the gardens, it's possible that this project or this work would have been less uh, less famous. You can even tell that I mean the buildings are left, you know, in a grayish mode of expression while the gardens are triumphantly uh, chromatic and uh, of course the sculptures add um, more life to, to the whole ensemble and the water, uh, you know, these are luxuries that we don't quite have today. But um, there are suggestions here that maybe we should reconsider certain things and then and, and, and invite the artists in the architectural uh, project, uh, uh, invite the sculptors, invite uh, the gardeners, uh, anyway. Uh, this is a drawing done recently. Why you see the, the two buildings um, here and then, uh, but, but again, the gardens are the ones that, um, give richness to, to the whole ensemble. Now, uh, the other famous work by him is this Chiesa del Chiesu in Rome, the mother church of the Jesuit order, which would become a source for Baroque church facades in the 17th century. You probably know it uh, since it's published in all the books and if you visit Rome, it's almost uh, impossible to miss it. Uh, I, I Again, I do not know what irritated Le Corbusier, but uh, uh, he was a complicated man. So, um, yeah, maybe he felt he was in some kind of a competition with Vignon. I, I don't know. Although the architecture of Vignola is very, very, very different from, from what he was doing and from what we are doing, so I don't understand why uh, <laughs> one would be so irritated by him, poor Vignola. Now these sculptures here at the top were not done, so the church uh, is deprived of certain things, but it is uh, it's still a good building. Um, Maybe not so refined in terms of uh, detail and decoration as Santa Maria Novella by Alberti in Florence. I'm thinking of that facade and particularly these, these parts, uh, which I don't know how they are called in, in architecture. They appear also in the work by Alberti, but these are very finely uh, decorated. Uh, here I see them kind of blunt, but anyway. Um, Inside though, yes, here I do see manneries, here I see tumultuousness, I see uh, almost uh, some kind of a longing for disintegration, and it's because of the artist. He didn't do the paintings, he did I mean, the frescoes, he didn't do the sculptures, but uh, you can tell, like uh, Bruce said, that uh, Theo van Dersburg uh, had an almost, uh, uh, you know, uh, tendency to, to sabotage architecture through, through his uh, graphic and, and colorful uh, interventions. 
here, so you would say that the painter and the sculptor uh, kind of try to, yeah, to both enhance and sabotage in a way the building. You know, so the, the building becomes pictorial because of maybe some kind of emulation that took place between the artist and the architect. But it, such an emulation, it could be actually a very positive thing. I mean, you, you, you see, the facade is as it is, but then inside is a different world. And it's because of the artist that it is a different world. And you see the plan, the facade. Well, the facade, if you remove the sculptures and the, the ones at the top who have not been done, it's kind of a calm building. You know, I don't really see it as mannerist. But when you have the artist, look at it inside. It is inflamed. It is an inflamed building. This is what artists are doing, you know. And we need the flames. I, I, I do believe we do, we do need them. Anyway, um, so um, now, of course, it is a church, you know. Uh, you 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 can't really easily do something like this at home, you know, or in a modern building that doesn't have the public relevance of such a church. Yeah, it was a different time, but look at the skill of, of, of the painters, of the artists, you know, they, they animate the building and he, you know, you, 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 you well, <laughs> I should say even these would not, uh, um, you know, destabilize the 2000 students here who nothing moves them, nothing moves them. It's unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> I don't understand. But yes, look, look, look uh, here the, the, the tumultuousness of art is uh, really almost uh, without borders. It's, uh, it's wild indeed. Okay, the Basilica of Santa Maria degli Angeli in Assisi, uh, uh, you know, kind of a morose building in a way. Um, the facade is kind of stern itself. Uh, and here I read that actually he was only, uh, he had some interventions, but the, 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 the main author was someone else, Galeazzo Alessi, projected by him. But in other sources, Jacopo Barozzi da Vignola is considered the author. So I, I don't know. The interior is kind of, uh, you know, uh, a little bit even like in Palladio, you know, whiteness and light and uh, no adornments. I mean, if you compare with the previous church, you would say, well, how could that be? Maybe they didn't have the, uh, I, I don't know, maybe they didn't want to complicate the building with, uh, <laughs> with uh, alarming interventions of the artists. Now, the Church of Sant'Andrea in Via Flaminia in Rome is the first church to have an oval dome, which became a signature of the Baroque. I like this church. It's very, uh, the only st uh, destabilizing uh, uh, factor or element here is the ellipse of the, of the central part, but otherwise, it's a almost cubistic building, uh, very, very, very stable. And uh, uh, I would say almost, you know, classical. I, I don't see anything mannerist here with the exception of the, of the oval, which makes it special. But I, I like this uh, dichotomy. I like this tension between a cube, which is the paradigm of stability, and then you have the, the elliptical tower, that is, uh, if not a paradigm of instability, and is not, but brings in some uh, anxiety, if I, can, if I can express myself in this way. And you see the, the, the plan. It's interesting now. It's, it's, it's almost a cube. It's not a perfect cube, but it's almost a cube with an ellipse within. And that ellipse, uh, a Freudian a psychoanalyst would say it represents the id the unconscious, the subconscious, the psych 
psychic shadow, you could know, name it in, in many ways. I don't know. But it was announcing, in a way, the future, because it was announcing the Baroque, which began to problematize the stability of classicism. Interesting church. Which, although I went a few times to Rome, I never saw, to my shame. Um, yeah. Something like this, and we'll see a church, well, an homage to Borromini by Mario Botta in the second presentation, that what I'm trying to say is, you know, that we could use some suggestions from the past for the present and, and make meaningful contributions to architecture without copying, but, but, but being very creative, but not ignorant of what preceded us. Palazzo dei Banchi in Bologna, uh, it is a palazzo, <laughs> palazzo indeed, uh, uh, the, the, the palace of the banks. That's what uh, Banchi means. I learned today, although I should have known because the language is not so uh, different than mine, but I didn't reflect on it until today. So, interesting combination of words, uh, you know, Palazzo, the Banchi, the palace of the banks. Uh, almost any bank is actually a, a palace because they can afford it. Yeah, this one doesn't have a very good resolution, but um, anyway. Um, the riches of Italy, almost any city has, uh, has uh, architectonic jewels and, and artistic jewels. Interesting how maybe this is a mannerist gesture, you know, these very small windows here, you know. <laughs> Yes, they are very small, um, kind of funny in a way. Uh, this is the drawing by Vignola, but uh, sorry, it's impossible to see. Also by uh, him, but uh, I, I couldn't find better resolution drawings. Now Palazzo Farnese in Piacenza. This was a grandiose, and this is the last one that I show in this presentation. This was a grandiose project of a vast palace palace on a scale paralleled only by the Vatican Palace in Italy. The rectangular plane is circa, uh, cir circa 111 meters by 88 meters. The actual construction, however, made up only less than a half of Vignola's original project and lacked many of the planned architectural features. Missing elements include part of the exterior surrounding walls, the main facade modeled on the ancient triumphal arch, and with a large tower and the theater, uh, theater in the large inner courtyard. Okay, uh, this one also has some the appearance of a fortress. It's a very massive building, and uh, I, I'm, I'm just presuming. I'm just trying to imagine what irritated Le Corbusier. Maybe this uh, this incredible massivity. You know, this maybe this says something about the character of Vignola. Um, Maybe he himself was kind of uh, opaque in a way and, and uh, fortress-like, if I can say so. If, if a human being can be a fortress-like, maybe he was. Maybe he was even uh, misanthropic to an extent. Anyway, uh, inside there are interesting things, but not easily readable. Uh, again, sorry for the, for the drawing. Um, Yes, a, a massive, uh, massive work, but I, 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 again, mannerism is not very explicit to me here. Unless we can talk about some kind of uh, mannerism in details or uh, a discrete mannerism, I don't know. And this is the last image. Uh, inside, again, the interior, uh, often in his works, are a little different, or not so little different than, than the exterior. The exterior is uh, almost uninviting, is stern, is rigid, is fortress-like. 
<clears throat> but inside you can you can discover riches, you can discover lyricism, you can discover arts. So maybe maybe this this uh, tension between the outside and the inside could maybe uh, be seen as some kind of a characteristic for Vignola, and we saw it also in the in the previous uh, works. And now, so I finished with Vignola, and uh, we, I almost felt like saying happy birthday, uh, Vignola, but he did, he was not born today, he died today. And now, if you allow me, I have this strange presentation about manneries today. I prepared it actually, uh, if Victor is still here for the, his, uh, his class, and I don't know if he was uh, present then, um, at Stefan Dorin, uh, an interesting studio in the university here. So, um, this one is uh, attempted some kind, attempting some kind of uh, uh, dialogue, if you want, in, between various forms of art. I ask for forgiveness when I prepare this presentation. I prepared it for the specific a specific context, so some of the text is not in English, but I will translate it, and it, the text is actually not so relevant, or not always. So in in English, it's called uh, manner and mania, and this, by the way, of the fact that Vignola was considered a mannerist architect. So I'll begin now. Um, so maniera and my maniera she mania in architecture today. I found this uh, this interesting quotation: "Beautiful mutants, if it's sweet and sad, sentimental and repulsive, cute and creepy, it must be postmodern manneries." Uh, I, maybe he put it well. I, I don't know, but. It is worth reflecting on, on the possibility of an architecture that is sweet and sad, sentimental and repulsive, cute and creepy. And some, some of architecture today is just like that. Now, this is uh, in, in Romanian, Remanier și Reanimare, I played with the words, translated in, into English would be some kind of uh, uh, shuffling and reanimations, shufflings and reanimations. It doesn't sound so good in, in, uh, in, in English. This is a, a very special uh, photographer and artist uh, who made very disturbing pictures. And for me, this is mannerism, where the distortion takes place in a, in a, in a, sometimes in a violent, violent way, very provocative. Maybe in architecture, this is not so easy, maybe, but not necessarily, because I'll show later some works that are uh, built today, and they have distortions and destabilizations that are quite dramatic. Now, these are the, 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 the photographs uh, that, that he made, um, Hans Bellmer. Uh, of course, the grot, to use a word by Peter Reisemann, grotesque, the grotesque is here, the visual grotesque is here. Uh, it's a, it's a, um, you know, it's it's an art that cannot leave you indifferent. You can you can uh, uh, you can uh, reflect on 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 these pictures, and uh, they 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 are disturbing. But uh, uh, maybe they tell the truth ab about certain things in in human life. Now they are done by a man. Here is the artist with his wife and one of his artworks, uh, these, these uh, uh, disturbing dolls. Le caille oblique, the oblique uh, notebooks. And uh, anyway, this was a, um, a poster for, for a lecture and an exhibition. Now, Parco, 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 uh, the, the Bomarzo Park in Italy, which uh, again, the, the, the grotesque, to use the word by Peter Eisenman, is, is so obvious, maybe too obvious. 
uh, you could say it, 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 it's a mannerist uh, um, distortion of, 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 uh, of uh, you know, artistic representation in the name of an effect that wants to be dramatic and unsettling. By comparison, the buildings by Vignola do not seem to me manneristic at all. But, uh, you know, they, uh, maybe uh, someone could, uh, could say something else. Again, the, the level of distortion and instability here is very high. And the narratives are, are uh, um, you know, uh, intentionally uh, provoking. Because mannerism sometimes works with different scales. What you expect to be, to be small, it makes very large. And what you expect to be very large, it makes very small. So there are all kinds of techniques or strategies to, dis to, crea to create a, a lack of stability or destabilization. I mean, an, an interesting picture now, almost a commentary what, uh, what uh, you know, marriage is. Uh, I just re remember what uh, Oscar Wilde said that one should be always in love that's why one should never get married. But this is the typical Oscar Wilde. Another interesting picture from the Bomarzo Park. Now, Mario Botta and Boromini. This was a, a building that Mario Botta built, and maybe you know it, uh, in Switzerland, uh, which is, I think, a very good uh, uh, homage that Bota uh, addressed to Borromini on, um, I don't know, 300 years, uh, or 350 or 400 years since he was born. Uh, I know that I did, a, I, I, I made a presentation uh, in Vienna uh, in 2017 when there were 350 years since uh, Borromini's death uh, on the 2nd of August. And uh, I also initiated an exhibition called Angst Baroque, and you will see some of the works of that exhibition here in this presentation. Seven architects from um, several countries. This is what he did, Bota, and I think he had a very interesting idea. He took San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane and sectioned it, and this is, this is what he did. This was the homage towards Boromini. I think it is a mannerist, in a way, uh, intervention or building or installation, but it's interesting and it's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's convincing. So the so-called creation here was to take the building by Borromini and uh, rebuild it in you know, a different material and just half of it. It's a, it's a good commentary on, on many things, and I, I, I could talk for a long time about it, but I will abstain now. Because in a way, when you pay an homage, you dissect the one you pay the homage to, because you, in, in order to connect with the one you are uh, uh, celebrating, you have to know a little bit uh, the work of that someone. And so, you know, in a way, this is what is illustrated here. The narrative is I, I dissect, I cut, I open up uh, San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane, uh, and in, in, by doing so, I come closer to Borromini and I pay homage to him. But it's also uh, the beauty of the ruin and of the fragment, which is very, I think we are, we are prone to be seduced by fragments and ruins today. A good work by, uh, of course, a good work by Borromini, but also a good work uh, uh, by, by Mario Botta. 
Now, a very uh, famous um, um, mannerist work, the Laurentian Library uh, or Biblioteca Laurentiana by Michelangelo. Uh, I talked about it a few days ago also. So Pope Clement also commissioned the Laurentian Library for which Michelangelo also designed the extraordinary vestibule with columns recessed into niches and the staircase that appears to spill out of the library like a flow of lava, according to Pevsner, revealing mannerism in its most sublime architectural form. Uh, architecture turned outside in. So we, we all know this um, famous um, stair in the vestibule. Uh, maybe the word vestibule is not quite uh, accurate because Yes, it is a vestibule, but uh, uh, at the same time, it's as if you are in, a, in an exterior space and the inner walls are actually exterior elevations surrounding the, uh, sorry, ah, I'm sorry about this. Ah, I pressed, um, forgive me, I pressed, uh, and I'm not going to show you this because I showed it yesterday. Um, I pressed by accident the last, um, okay, the last, um, okay. Uh, picture of this, but you are not going to say, see that uh, today. Okay, so from current slide. Okay, so this is the the famous um, uh, stair uh, built by, and yes, it is it is coming towards the the visitor like a lava in a way. From where? From the room where the actual actual library is, and which is the room of knowledge, because that's what a room that's what a library is. Uh, I want to make sure I don't press again the wrong button here. You know this work, and uh, this is just an example of, of a mannerist, truly uh, mannerist uh, architecture and art. Uh, but here, maybe when you, you, you cannot you cannot say architecture and art. I, here, architecture is art. A remarkable work by uh, Michelangelo. Quite a vestibule, no? <laughs> I mean, um, usually when you use this word, uh, we don't not ex we do not expect to see something like this. There are books written about just about this vestibule. Now, here I had a, maybe a bizarre idea of a ripped architecture. You know that the ripped jeans are fashionable, but what about a ripped architecture? Just as you buy a pair of jeans that are ripped, uh, I don't know, maybe they have a different wording, but you know what I'm referring to, and I'll even show some pictures. What about an architecture that is ripped? Uh, and unfortunately, forgive me here, it's not in English, but in, uh, I will translate. There are actually three question marks towards an architecture that is, uh, well, kind of fractured, uh, ripped. Uh, um, unfortunately, <laughs> the, the words are almost uh, difficult to translate into an English uh, architectural capita. An architecture that, you know, like a sweater that has a hole in it and you try to repair that hole and you see the the intervention and what about such an architecture that was damaged and you try to repair it but without hiding uh, you know the fact that you are uh, your intervention is uh, distinct from the from the from the birth of the building look at these jeans you know they they are very fashionable well what about buildings that that are ripped some, somehow in, 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 in the same way. That you, in a way you could say they, are, they could be wounded, wounded buildings. That in the, in the wound, you discover the, how the building was made. It betrays some, some, some of its viscera. It betrays something, uh, on one hand, uh, you know, the process that, that made it uh, possible. And on the other hand, uh, it says something about uh, its biography, you know, maybe uh, a, a wounding or a wounded biography. 
I don't know. I I I have a preference, but this is a personal, uh, you know, prefer. Pre I I like I like uh, the sentimental person I am. Sometimes I like uh, ruins or or even uh, things that are fractured. But I think the idea to make a building, you know, that that at least in some parts are are uh, you know. Uh, fragmented in this way and even distorted or, or, or uh, uh, yeah, wounded, as I, as I said before, maybe, maybe there is some potential here. I don't know. And it's just a thought I had. Maybe uh, it's nothing very profound. Anyway. Because actually in the wound, if I call it so, uh, you can bring in some uh, uh, destabilization of a mannerist uh, order, and uh, there you could uh, you could uh, uh, even bring in uh, uh, you know uh, some 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 form of ornamentation, something that breaks off the placid uh, uh, self-assured uh, structure that doesn't tell you anything about. Uh, you know the, the possible accidents of life or um, you know anyway i don't know if i was very inspired in my uh, attempt to describe what i wanted to describe but it, it's a thought of, of provoking uh, excessive uh, stability with uh, with um, you know accidental uh, wounds now i show you a house in belgium which is very interesting and i discovered it by accident jacques Gier. It, I, I actually uh, I, I would place it in the same uh, at the same level of relevance with uh, Villa Savoie and uh, the Falling Water, although it is they're very opposite. This is the house. Can you believe it? Uh, and 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 they live there. I mean, uh, uh, it is used. But it is a ruin, it is a modern ruin, it is uh, uh, sculptural, but it's also, uh, it, it doesn't, it is uh, self-derogatory in a way, it is not uh, proclaiming an optimism that it doesn't have. I find it very interesting. And uh, it is architecture, it is not nature, but uh, uh, it, it is an architecture that has nothing triumphalist about it. And the inside, yes, it's more uh, colorful, but uh, um, yeah, I, 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 well, you know, that I guess they didn't have money to, to, to find a different kind of furniture. And maybe that's good. This is, these are almost uh, furniture pieces found on the street. But the building, I think, is very interesting. And uh, I don't know if it's uh, organically connected with the theme that I try to address here, meaning manner is today. But in the sense of having a destabilizing structure, yes, it is. And here are the, the inhabitants, probably very bourgeois, but the, the house is not bourgeois at all. And to be honest with you, I think I would feel myself very well in this house. Um, now, what a distance no, from Vignola. Uh, yeah. In a way, we did gain some freedom, you know, uh, and maybe, maybe that's what... Uh, uh, Le Corbusier was pointing uh, towards or at that um, all the canons, all the dogmas, all the the, the advices, uh, wise of course of Vignola, could be actually disregarded. And and this house uh, has no use at all for the for the recommendations, uh, the scholastic recommendations of Vignola. Now, Giulio Romano, great, great, great architect. Uh, we have to celebrate him accordingly. This is just a short introduction to an architect who was indeed mannerist in the best sense of the word. At the time when we are talking about the mannerism of the 16th century, Palazzo del Te. Now, here we do have a, a mannerist architect, not like Vignola. I'm sorry. I mean, here you see 
disturbances and distortions and destabilizing, uh, uh, you know, uh, elements uh, uh, that are immediate, immediately visible, although the language is still based on the classical uh, idiom. But it is something uh, unsettling here. He was a great architect, Giulio Romano, and you'll see. Um, unfortunately, some of these pictures are not so good. Um, so like Vignola, he worked with uh, symmetry he worked with uh, what he received, you know, uh, but uh, the level of betrayals is, is higher. And in a way, this is what mannerism is, is a, is a betrayal. It's a betrayal of, 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 of a classical uh, uh, dogma or uh, recipe, or uh, I don't know how to call it, in which the artist or the architect doesn't believe any longer. So you see here, you know, various, it's a collage of various architectural elements combined capriciously and sometimes without a sense of, you know, quiet uh, proportioning at all. They, they aim at, 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 at a distortion and this uh, artwork uh, shows it actually explicitly. The columns are falling apart and the people are tormented it's a different world. It's a world that doesn't believe any longer in the, in the stability of classicism. And here, this, this belief is, is, is dramatically uh, illustrated. Now, the Ducal Palette in Mantua, you, you see already uh, snake-like um, columns which would have been inconceivable uh, with a classical mentality. Uh, Bernini used them, of course, uh, in the, for the Baldac in uh, San Pietro, but he was already a Baroque artist and architect. But even he didn't, wouldn't dare, I think, to do something like this as, as Giulio Romano did, to put them on the facade, spiraling columns, like snakes on the facade. Now, his own house, Giulio Romano house, uh, an interesting house itself. Still standing. Hello, Mr. Romano. We'll talk about you more in detail uh, <laughs> at one point. We have to find out when your birthday will was and will take care of it because you deserve it. So mannerism is also about conflict, of course. You saw this. Pittore e architetto. Pittore e architetto. Superb. Astros my uh, today we don't uh, have very often something like this. Although, although I will give, I will show a few examples of what I would call a mannerist architecture today, starting with Tomain from uh, uh, Morphosis and Frank Gehry, Herzog and de Moron, Peter Eisenman, Francois Roche, Francois Roche, not Francois, sorry, there is an E there which I have to remove and Greg Lin. I don't know if I actually show the works of Francois Roche and Greg Lin, but I, I, I want to invite one day Francois Roche. I don't know, he's a difficult man. I don't know if he will accept the invitation, but it would be very nice if he would accept to have a talk with us. Um, now, there are uh, a few references to possible ways to, to uh, destabilize architecture. One is against perspective, or towards the labyrinth. Uh, here in translation would be towards the scientific lack of clarity. <laughs> uh, 
I was sarcastic in a way, but uh, because I have a problem with um, what is called, uh, you know, scientific or science. Here is a manifesto I wrote against functionalism. And if you allow me, I'll read it to you. Uh, uh, it is not funny. It is not exciting. It is plain boring. Life should not be comfortable, but challenging. Functionalism is not challenging. There is no struggle involved. Things are perfect, so we navigate through functionalist spaces like a duck in the water. No water stains. Who needs that? We need a struggle. We need the discomfort of the pioneers who, entering a virgin forest, did not and do not find conveniently built asphalted walkways. Give us back discomfort. Fuck functionalism. It is highly dysfunctional, this gay, gray, mediocre functionalism, because for our soul and our thirst for a much needed sense of adventure, it is boring like hell. We don't need it. We need danger and discomfort. We need to feel alive like a rejected lover in quest for the affection of the loved one. Process is everything. The way to give us back discomfort and bury no effort. Give us dejection and struggle, painful struggle. The more, the better. Give us dysfunctionalism. We would love it with the same ardor the dejected lover loves the object or subject of his or her desire. Give us back desire. Give us a feeling that we are still needed on this earth, that not everything was solved. Sorry again for the non-academic way of expressing myself, and I usually avoid something like this, but I did write, fuck functionalism, functionalism. Sorry. <laughs> I wrote this, uh, no one else. Now, Monsu Desiderio, uh, at the end of the 16th century, he actually, no one knows exactly if there was a single artist or two artists or even three artists who depicted this uh, uh, truly destabilized and destabilizing architecture. There are the, the, the most uh, believed theory is that there were three artists, maybe three brothers or three friends, who signed with the same name, uh, born uh, or uh, being active in the south of Italy, in, um, in either Sicily or Napoli. Or, uh, but but this nothing is, uh, is uh, there is no certitude in, in relation with them. But they have very interesting paintings. And you see here the, the distortions of mannerism relating to architecture. Uh, very much so. They they depict architectural scenes, but uh, uh, you know we are already in surrealism. We are already maybe even close to Dali in a certain way. There is phantasmagoria. There are hallucinations. There is distractions. There are distractions. Uh, there is disorder. Uh, there is death, but there is also. Uh, something, uh, I mean, there is chaos, but there is also uh, somehow some suggestion to a possible uh, kind of rebirth out of this pain. I don't know you, you, if you knew about these artists. I, uh, I, I knew of them for, for a number of years, but I thought of including them in this uh, PowerPoint presentation. Now, this is a, a quotation from Friedrich Kiesler that I totally agree with. And Kiesler is a very admired designer and architect, especially in the West and in the United States, not so much in the country he was actually born in. Well, he didn't recognize that he was born here. He said that he was born in Austria. Well, it was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Anyway, I oppose to the mysticism of Hygiene, which is the superstition of functional architecture, Remember what I wrote before, the realities of a magical architecture rooted in the totality of the human being and not in the blessed or accursed parts of this being. I totally agree. Functionalism uh, uh, went too far in claiming that it knows the golden road to a golden architecture. It's not like that. It, it was done on the, on the corpse of many other things that are truly important. So I think he chose the correct language, the mysticism of Hygiene, you know, uh, and, and we forgot about the magical architecture. 
which is rooted in the totality of the human being and not only on some parts of this being. Uh, I agree with Kistler. Now the labyrinth, here uh, there are some words with which I try to approximate some kind of uh, mannerist approach to, to art and to life, the mirror, the paradox, sophistication, deformations, artificiality, the double sense, ambiguity, instability, discontinuity, tension, and conflict. Uh, this one, okay, Peter Eisenman, uh, an early house by him, which is an, uh, a mannerist house, if you want to use uh, this word. It is uh, destabilizing and disorienting and uh, <laughs> probably very troubling for the people who live there until they left in this array. Uh, this is the School of Architecture in Cincinnati, built by uh, Peter Eisenman. Uh, and then uh, this, uh, unfortunately, unbuilt uh, work for Max Reinhardt. This could have been one of his most impressive works, but it was not built. Uh, I regret personally, maybe this image is not uh, the best I, I, I could have found, but uh, there is another one. Well, this work, the Wexner uh, Museum is, um, I even wrote against it at one moment, but um, you know about Peter Eisenman, it was said somebody found a very funny in a way and, and truthful uh, way of describing his architecture. It smells like it, it tastes like it, but it's not it. It's like he called, that critic called it decaf architecture. So decaffeinated architecture. It tastes like it, it smells like it, but it's not it. This is kind of what the architecture of Peter Eisenman is. Tom Main. I think Tom Main is one, uh, a very important architect, and not because he received the Pritzker Prize, but uh, he uh, is complex and he's interesting, and uh, uh, maybe Bruce will invite him one day to, it would be an honor to have him with us for a few minutes, at least. Uh, so he runs the office called uh, um, Morphosis. He draws very, very well. Uh, maybe th this is the facade for the Cooper Union building in New York, which he built, and I hope I have Im images here. Um, he has very lyrical drawings, uh, maybe even more lyrical than his architecture, but the drawings are very lyrical. Well, Wolf Prix uh, said, and I think correctly, that Tom Main is a master of drawing and uh, Eric Owen Moss is a master of uh, wording, of, of the words. We'll arrive at Eric Owen Moss too. I don't know what this is. I think a collage that the Tom Main did this is the building of uh, the Cooper Union in uh, New York, uh, the new building, because the old building, which is not far away, uh, is very different. It's, it's, it's an exciting building, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's very interesting. But you see the cuts, the distortions, the, the, the wounds, in a way, of the building. The Mannerist art is not afraid to externalize something that the classical art hides. Now, of course, you could say it seems to find some kind of perverse pleasure in divulging these wounds, maybe. Herzog and de Moron, I, I think they are, they are indeed uh, Mannerist architects today, very much so much more than uh, Vignola in his time. You know their works, I, I will not insist on them. Uh, but, but one day, of course, we'll make a presentation. Uh, we'll dedicate one evening or one day to, to them. Jean Nouvel. Jean Nouvel, who has sometimes, um, even here, even at L'Institut du Monde Arabe in Paris, even here there are some uh, uh, dislocating or disturbing so-called accidents or details, you know, in a, in a discreet way. The greed is, 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 is regular, yes, so-called classical. But then you have uh, 
uh, you have these openings that uh, open, uh, you know, with a certain level of irregularity, and thus they irritate a little bit the system. And this apartment building in uh, in uh, Manhattan, also because of the collage of the windows, and uh, it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to 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 read here the structure of the building. So this is a clothing, it's a mask in a way. And even the tower for the Museum of Modern Art in New York is, uh, you see how the structure is. Uh, is uh, those diagonals are bringing in, uh, you know, uh, disturbing, uh, disturbing element in the sense that uh, you know, they, they challenge the, the stability that is usually associated with a, with a tall building. And here the light, the light does the, unfortunately, I think he, uh, he made a mistake because the, that cover of, of, of the museum is, is, is too central and is too regular and it's actually based on a circle. It's circular. And uh, there seems to be a contradiction if you compare the lyricism uh, and the instability that the light so poetically brings in with a, that centralized form. I, I think he could have done something better there. Anyway, Frank Gehry, of course, he couldn't, he couldn't, couldn't miss this chance to uh, alert us with his own distortions. Now, uh, Gehry, as you know, he was not, uh, influenced by, by the Mannerists, by the, but by Bernini. It was Bernini, apparently, who had a, a strong influence on, on, on Frangieri. But in between Baroque and Mannerism, it's not such a long uh, road at all. This one also, we have uh, distortions and destabilizations of, of, of the most disturbing kind. Maybe too disturbing. And of course, you know this one as well. And this one, and this one. Eric Owen Moss, who also uh, uh, problematizes uh, stability in, a, in an explicit way, uh, and in an interesting way often. So here we have moderns who are truly uh, uh, acting in the direction of uh, destabilizing uh, architecture. And of course, there are many examples. I only show some. But I wonder what Vignola would have thought if he saw something like this. Because by comparison, Vignola was really a baby, if I can say so. You know, I mean, <laughs> I don't even think we would still call him uh, a mannerist. And Hernan Diaz Alonso, I will end soon. Hernan Diaz Alonso, for whom I don't know if Bruce is still here, but Bruce did the, the structure for, uh, he was the structural engineer for a work built by uh, Hernan, and I don't know if he built something else besides that at PS1 in New York. I will show also some projects done by, uh, by his students in Vienna at the Institute of Architecture. And this is what I will show, in fact. Just to, just, to, just to give you an idea about uh, how far we went in our attempt to, to, to turn our back on, 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 the, on what is uh, predictable and common and uh, stable, and I'm not even using the word classic. These people uh, use, uh, uh, they work with Maya, and if Victor is still here, he knows this because I showed this uh, before. From time to time I show it because I, I want to provoke the students here with works that are so different from what they do, but it seems nothing can <laughs> alert them. Anyway, this is the exhibition I did in Vienna in 2017. I gave, I gave it this, this title, Angst Baroque, uh, and if it is connected with mannerism, uh, if you allow me, I usually don't like to read, but I will read it because it, it has some relevance 
Uh, and I, I don't know, I, I had a feeling I was inspired when I wrote it, but uh, it remains, you will be the ones who, who can truly say if, if I was. So I'll read it very quickly. In a way, the Baroque, as we know it, the historical Baroque, was the very opposite of angst. Or rather, it was hiding behind a plethora of opulent forms, trembling and bleeding unseen. But the horror vacui of the Baroque was never probably an easy matter. Just as people fill pages and pages with scribbles and doodles at the end of their notebooks, the Baroque artist in his excesses expresses something, express something that was not only of an aesthetic nature. But what is or could be angst Baroque? It is a Baroque that refuses to be sweet. It is a Baroque that finds in opulence not a source of forgetfulness, but a source of amplified trembling. Fear and trembling are paramount in angst Baroque. <clears throat> Equally paramount is the preeminence of nature, not the nature of Eve or Eva, the one who out of curiosity ruined the beautiful integration with it, but with, with but that of Lilith, the primordial woman, the dark woman, the woman of the wild bushes, incessant proliferation of vegetative chaos and the moon, of course. It is for Lilith that the Angst Baroque architects build, for that woman, the architect builds, for that woman before Abraham. There is revolt in this work and there is an acknowledging of what is not mapped, since indeed the mountain or the jungle preceded the map that human surveilled. If the deconstruction was a revolt against history, Angst Baroque is a revolt against white history and an assertion of what was taboo, neglected, dismissed and discarded. This deconstruction rejected history and nature alike. Angst Baroque asserts both history and nature with the result that they can destroy each other while asserting each other. As such, Angst Baroque moves beyond deconstruction since it fights not only the domestication of history but also the domestication of nature. It is not an accident that Ax Baroque returns to primeval animals and primeval vegetation, dinosaurs, archaeopteryx, and untrimmed wild greenery, but with an abundance that is not very much different than the abundance of the historical Baroque, except that this Baroque is full of angst, since our choice of calling it Angst Baroque. We, are all, we already entered the new millennium, so deconstruction had its worth. Now it seems we continue our protest, but from a more complex position. The turbulence of Angst Baroque is animated by a very anxious spiral, as opposed to the rather linear anxiety of deconstruction. There is a move towards the round, the curve, the spiral, and the tormented turbulences of tornadoes and hurricanes and all kinds of poisonous snakes that make Angst Baroque organic while the construction was pre predominantly linear and graphic. The sphere, the round, in essence the eternal return of the same, populate tormented and tormenting forms as if there are seismic energies that circle within and around us endlessly. Around apocalypse, that is what Angst Baroque seems to proclaim, the hair of Lilith, as if in the anxious drawings of Leonardo. We want to be silent now. No more words, just the whirling of cosmic forces and human forces united and disjuncted by a common drama. Angst Baroque screams in circles, inviting us, inviting us in a whirlpool of voices of diachronic symphonic work wiped out by, wiped by an angry god out of imbalance. We scream, we are in pain, we are victims of and provokers of the cosmic and human-made cataclysm. Let's watch and let's participate. The chorus is mad, plant and animal and human are disjointed, yet together in a new search. Let's search, let's scream together, give me the labyrinth of God. We are entering a new age, the age of Lilith. Now you'll see the works. So these are the works, these are the diploma works at IOA, the Institute of Architecture in Vienna, 
and that program, uh, Excessive, was run by Hernan Diaz Alonso, who is now the, the dean uh, at um, uh, SciArc in Los Angeles. Uh, so this is uh, Hernan uh, here on the left, and uh, you will see the, some, some diplomas, uh, just some of them. Uh, can you imagine? This is uh, an architecture that was uh, uh, pro pro proposed in a diploma by one of the students. Now maybe you understand better uh, or see a certain relationship with the text I just read. Yes, it is the return of the labyrinth, it is a return of turbulence, it, it, it's, a, it's a fight against simple answers and classes and order and the greed and so on, in tormented and tormenting ways, frightening ways as well. Without Maya, this would not have been possible. These people studied for one semester and a half Maya, and then the others, one semester and a half, they did their diplomas. We are so far away, and not so far actually, when you consider the, the artist's work in the buildings by uh, Vignola, in, especially in the church in Rome, where uh, the, truly the artists try to, 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 to smash, in a way, the building through, through their artistic uh, interventions. But here you have the architects smashing themselves or the building on the left and the building on the right through maddening forms. Look at this plan. This is the plan of the building, an insertion between two buildings. This is the section. And this is the rear facade. A little morbid, yes, but but if we compare uh, its morbidity with the morbidity of the buildings on the left and on the right, this one at least is interesting. And inside, yes, the labyrinth. Maybe too much so. The functionalist would say, well, how could I bring a piano in? Yes, maybe it wouldn't be very easy. This is another project. And these people were not uh, students, they were already architects. This was a postgraduate program in Vienna. So uh, some young architects, adventurous enough, entered this program and you see their diploma work there. Uh, it's a different conception about architecture and about the education in architecture. For example, at SciArc, they say, to hell with regulations, we are going for the unknown. And this is what we see here. They are going for the unknown. Maybe it's an unknown that is unsettling and disturbing, yes, but, but they are searching for something that is not, was not seen, unless we remember the Bomarzo, Bomarzo Park that we saw some images of. Yes, it is the uh, disturbing form of architecture, but uh, uh, you know, at first, much of the art of the world was 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 disturbing. Okay, that's it. I end it. If, if anyone is still here, um, I would be glad to hear a few thoughts from you. If I'm left alone, uh, oh no, you actually more. You are more people than at the beginning than when I started. And Bruce is still here. I'm very happy because, because, uh, because you are from Los Angeles and because you know Hernan. And I talked a little bit about Hernan now. So um, uh, I, I, I know I, I went a little bit away from, from Vignola, but if he was considered a... Uh, uh, you know, uh, mannerist, I thought of uh, plunging into, into something more dramatic, and that is our own time uh, today. <laughs>